There was an article this week in the Wall Street Journal business section on uh, Boar's Head, kind of the company's family struggle. Many of you may be familiar with Boar's Head. They make deli meats. Uh, they were recently in the news because of a listeria outbreak at one of their sites, killing, I think, 12 people. Uh, <clears throat> Well, the article, I think, was probably prompted by some of the chaos going on in the company. And they were talking about the sort of interfamily struggles happening at the company. Borshead was founded in the early 1900s um, by a man named Frank Brunkhorst, I believe. Uh, he then turned the company over to his son and his son-in-law. They, in turn, turned the company over to their kids, so the people who would be first cousins... But the first cousins had fallings out and they didn't have much to do with one another and so they're trying to run this company while being uh, sort of estranged from one another. Currently the company is in the hands of their kids, so the second cousins. And the article in the Wall Street Journal was about uh, one of the cousins, Eric, who is suing the other cousins uh, because he doesn't think he has enough of the share of the company. The cousins are then saying publicly that Eric's just not a very good employee and they don't really need him around and so he shouldn't have more control over the company. And just reading the article, you come away thinking, what a mess. Unfortunately, this is not an isolated situation. There are lots of family businesses where the transition from one generation to the next doesn't go very well. But of course, it's not just family businesses either. Uh, Situations like Bob Iger at Disney or uh, Howard Schultz at Starbucks who had hand-picked successors that they turned the companies they were running over to only to become kind of disenfranchised with how they were doing it and then trying to take control again. At the school that I went to growing up, the longtime football coach uh, retired and handed it over to his hand-picked successor who ended up running the program in a way that the uh, sort of old football coach wasn't so happy with, and he became estranged from the program that he helped build. Lots of pastors and ministry leaders turn over the ministry they've worked so hard in to the next generation, only to find that the next generation doesn't take care of the ministry the way that they wanted them to. Those kinds of transitions are difficult from one generation to the next. Now, if you asked the, the pastors or the ministry leaders who received the ministry, or if you asked the football coach who received the program, or if you asked the CEOs who were the ones to whom the company was given, they would have their own story about how the previous generation did not do a very good job in what they gave to them. And we realize that on both sides, transitions are difficult. Now, you may be here this morning and think, well, but I'm not a football coach and I'm not a ministry leader and I'm not a CEO of a company, so I don't have to worry about those things. Well, if you have children, it's important to think about what you're passing on to the next generation. If you are a child, meaning if you have parents at any point in your life, it's important what was handed on to you. And simply just being part of this church. I mean, we've received something from a previous generation and we are handing something on to the next generation. And it's important to think about those transitions. They can be messy, they can be difficult. But what is it that we have received from those who came before us and what is it that we're passing on to those who come after us? Well, the Lord wants to speak to us about that today. So let me invite you to take a Bible and turn to the book of Ecclesiastes, chapter 2. Ecclesiastes, chapter 2, it's page 540 in the church Bibles. Ecclesiastes, chapter 2. We have a little bit longer passage this morning. I'm going to read from verses 12 to verses from verse 12 to verse 26. So listen carefully as I read, especially as Solomon, the author of Ecclesiastes, is thinking about transitions from one generation to the next. Ecclesiastes 2, page 540, starting in verse 12. Then I turn my thoughts to consider wisdom and also madness and folly, what more can the king's successor do than what has already been done? 
I saw that wisdom is better than folly, just as light is better than darkness. The wise have eyes in their heads while the fool walks in the darkness. But I came to realize that the same fate overtakes them both. Then I said to myself, the fate of the fool will overtake me also. What then do I gain by being wise? I said to myself, this too is meaningless. For the wise, like the fool, will not long, be long remembered. The days have already come when both have been forgotten. Like the fool, the wise too must die. So I hated life because the work that is done under the sun was grievous to me. All of it is meaningless, a chasing after the wind. I hated all the things I had toiled for under the sun because I must leave them to the one who comes after me. And who knows whether that person will be wise or foolish, yet they will have control over all the fruit of my toil into which I have poured my effort and skill under the sun. This too is meaningless. So my heart began to despair over all my toilsome labor under the sun. For a person may labor with wisdom, knowledge, and skill, and then they must leave all they own to another who has not toiled for it. This too is meaningless and a great misfortune. What do people get for all the toil and anxious striving with which they labor under the sun? All their days their work is grief and pain. Even at night their minds do not rest. This too is meaningless. A person can do nothing better than to eat and drink and find satisfaction in their own toil. This too I see is from the hand of God for without him who can eat or find enjoyment. To the person who pleases him, God gives wisdom, knowledge, and happiness, but to the sinner, he gives the task of gathering and storing up wealth to hand it over to the one who pleases God. This too is meaningless, a chasing after the wind. Do you hear Solomon's frustration with the idea of transitions? Both the transition of what he received, that's actually what verse 12 is talking about. Solomon is talking about his predecessor, his father, King David. What more can I as the successor do than what my father already did? So he's struggling with that transition, what he was given by his father. And then even more so, he's struggling with what am I going to hand on to those who come after me? That's verses 17 to 26. Solomon is talking about it seems meaningless and hopeless. You do all this work and you build this thing and whether it's a football program or a company or it's a classroom that you've been teaching in or a school that you've poured your heart into, a community that you've been invested in, whatever it may be, you do all this time and energy and effort and then you hand it on to somebody else and who knows what they're going to do with it. Now one of the blessings of Ecclesiastes is the Holy Spirit is giving words to the feelings of our heart. Transitions from one generation to the next can be maddening. They can be frustrating. As a parent, you can look at your children and say, why is this going this direction? As a child, you can look at a parent and say, why did you give this to me? And Ecclesiastes is giving words to say, if you feel this way, if you look at the next generation, if you look at what you're handing off to the next group and you think, this feels meaningless, or if what you have received from a parent or a predecessor has been filled with dysfunction and difficulty, it feels meaningless, it feels hopeless, it feels maddening. And the Holy Spirit is saying, yes, those are valid feelings. It's valid to feel that the transition from one generation to the next is difficult and fraught with danger. But as is the case in Ecclesiastes, not only does the Holy Spirit provide validation for our feelings as we observe what is happening in our lives and in this world, the Holy Spirit also provides a clue about how to think about these things differently how we can think about the transition from one generation to the next differently than what Solomon is talking about here. And the Holy Spirit has left us a clue in verse 26. 
To the person who pleases him, God gives wisdom, knowledge, and happiness. But to the sinner, he gives the task of gathering and storing up wealth to hand it over to the one who pleases God. That's the clue that even though transitions from one generation to the next can be difficult, frustrating, and feel futile, that God has a different way for us to think about that. Now, with that clue in mind, how do we unpack that? Well, Solomon says, who knows who you're going to turn all this stuff over to? Well, he didn't know who he was going to turn all this stuff over to when he wrote Ecclesiastes. But we actually know who he turned all this stuff over to. We actually know who his successor was. And by looking at how that went, we can come to understand something about how the transition from one generation to the next, both from those who are handing something on and those who are receiving something from those who came before, we can understand from the transition in Solomon's life some clues as to what verse 26 is talking about and how we might be able to do this better than what Solomon is presenting. So let me invite you to turn in your Bibles to 2 Chronicles chapter 10. Sorry, 2 Chronicles chapter 10. 2 Chronicles 10, it's page 352. In Ecclesiastes, Solomon says, who knows who their successor is going to be, but by 2 Chronicles 10, we know Solomon's successor is his son, a man named Rehoboam. And in 2 Chronicles 10, 11, and 12, we have the story of Rehoboam, Solomon's successor. And there are two things from Rehoboam's life that we see that Solomon handed on to him that are documented in these chapters. The first is in 2 Chronicles 10, and the story is, after 40 years of Solomon being king, Solomon passes away, and turns the kingdom over to his son, Rehoboam. Well, as Rehoboam, the new king, is coming to power, a man named Jeroboam, it gets a little confusing because they sound the same, Rehoboam is the son. Jeroboam is a person that sort of represents the tribes of Israel, and he comes to Rehoboam and says, Hey, look, you're now the new king. We would love it if you would make our lives a little easier than your dad did. We pick up the story in verse 6. 2 Chronicles 10, page 352, verse 6. Then King Rehoboam consulted the elders who had served his father Solomon during his lifetime. How would you advise me to answer these people, he asked. They replied, if you will be kind to these people and please them and give them a favorable answer, They will always be your servants. But Rehoboam rejected the advice the elders gave him and consulted the young men who had grown up with him who were serving him. He asked them, what is your advice? How should we answer these people who say to us, say to me, lighten the yoke your father put on us? The young men who had grown up with him replied, the people have said to you, your father put a heavy yoke on us, but make our yoke lighter. Now tell them, my little finger is thicker than my father's waist. My father laid on you a heavy yoke, I will make it even heavier. My father scourged you with whips, I will scourge you with scorpions. Rehoboam listens to the younger men. (laughs) And guess what? It doesn't go very well. He says this to the people, And the people say, well, what do we want to do with you? And so Jeroboam leads the ten tribes in the north in secession from the union. And the country is split. Two tribes in the south and ten tribes in the north. Jeroboam says, we're not not following you anymore, Rehoboam. And so the country is split because of these actions. Now at first blush, when you hear this story you probably think, well, Rehoboam should have listened to the advice that the older men gave him and not listened to the advice that his young friends gave him. Yes, that's true, but there's more here. The issue is, 
God has been very clear, regardless of what old men say or young men say, God has made it very clear in the law, we looked at Deuteronomy 17 last, year, last week, that the king is not supposed to treat his servants this way. He's supposed to be kind. He's supposed to serve them. He's not supposed to think of himself as better than they are. God has been very clear about this. And in the law, even if you don't understand that part, one of the basic tenets of the law is love your neighbor as yourself. Kings are not exempt from that. So the issue here for Rehoboam is he's listening to advice rather than obeying the Lord. We can, get, we can get fascinated with whose advice is he listening to, but the problem is he's making decisions listening to advice instead of obeying the Lord. Where do you think Rehoboam got that from? From Solomon. This is what his dad did. His dad consciously disobeyed Deuteronomy 17. His dad went with the advice that he thought was wise. Now you might look at Rehoboam and you think, well, if he had just listened to the adults, that would have helped. But if he had obeyed the Lord, well, he would have been in great shape. This is the problem with the legacy of handing on to your children, listen to advice. You don't get to control whose advice they listen to. But if you train them to obey the Lord, then in every situation, they're going to do what is right. And so this is the first case where we see Solomon's legacy being handed on to Rehoboam and it going poorly. A second example, 2 Chronicles 12. So look over at the next page, 353. Verses 13 and 14, 2 Chronicles 12. King Rehoboam established himself firmly in Jerusalem and continued as king. He was 41 years old when he became king and reigned 17 years in Jerusalem, the city the Lord had chosen out of all, of the, tri out of all the tribes of Israel in which to put his name. Now pay attention to this last little bit. His mother's name was Nama. She was an Ammonite. He did evil because he had not set his heart on seeking the Lord. There's a reason why the Holy Spirit writes verse 14 immediately following verse 13. Rehoboam's mom is not a believer in Yahweh. She's not an Israelite. She's an Ammonite. God was very clear. Don't marry foreign wives who don't believe in me because they will turn your heart and the hearts of your children away from me. Did Solomon obey? He did not. He marries someone who is not a believer in Yahweh and they have a child together, Rehoboam. And guess what? Rehoboam ends up doing evil for most of his life. This is Solomon's folly. Come home to roost. God was very clear. Don't do this. Solomon ignored that, did what he wanted, married this woman, Nama. They had a child. And not surprising, the child was raised without the fear of the Lord. See, the hard truth is in Ecclesiastes, Solomon says, who knows what it's going to be like for the person who follows you? But the truth of the matter is, we actually do know something about what will happen for those who follow us. And the truth of the matter is, if you choose disobedience, you're going to hand that on to your children. You're going to hand that on to those who come after you. If you engage in gambling, if you engage in selfishness, if you engage in marrying non-Christians, if you engage in listening to the advice of the world and disobeying God, if you engage in pornography, if you engage in greed, there's a pretty good chance that the people who come after you are going to receive from you those sorts of behaviors and the dysfunction is going to continue. Remember the verse says, for those who please God, Solomon didn't listen to his own advice. And guess what? His worst fears in Ecclesiastes 2 come to pass. It's interesting that most of the work Solomon does in the kingdom 
is in the northern tribes. He builds up cities in the north. And what happens to all those tribes in the north? They secede from his son because of Solomon's legacy. See, Ecclesiastes is not giving us the full story. The full st- yes, it is maddening to think about handing stuff on to the next generation. But how much better would it have been if Solomon had listened to his own advice and sought to please the Lord? Now, I know the question you're thinking. Am I saying that if you do the right thing, that your kids, the football coach that comes after you, the teacher who inherits your classroom, the ministry leader who takes over your ministry, if you do the right thing, am I guaranteeing that the next generation is going to also take what you've given them and do something good with that? No, I am not. I'm not guaranteeing that because I can't guarantee that and no one can because of the reality of free will and the power of sin. But what I am saying is if you seek to please the Lord, you're giving yourself the best possible opportunity that the next generation will take what you have given them and do something that is a blessing instead of a curse. If you choose disobedience, it's not going to be surprising that they follow in your footsteps. If you choose to please the Lord, you at least got a shot. Okay. But what if you're here this morning and you feel more like Rehoboam? And you're thinking less about handing something on to the next generation and thinking more about what you've received from the previous generation. Maybe your parent or your predecessor in whatever ministry or workplace environment or the school you're in or community, maybe your predecessor looks a lot like Solomon. Maybe they look outwardly successful in the world's eyes. Maybe you've got a parent or a predecessor who from the world's point of view killed it. They just were awesome at whatever they were doing. What if your parent or predecessor used to walk with the Lord like Solomon did and doesn't anymore? What if your parent or predecessor has been choosing acts of disobedience just like Solomon did, and what you have received from them has been dysfunctional. What if you're Rehoboam this morning? Well, we skipped over a really interesting part of Rehoboam's life in chapter 12. The story goes, Rehoboam's become king. As we just heard, he generally chose wicked things. At one point, God raises up an enemy to come and oppose Rehoboam. Verse 5, we pick up the story, 2 Chronicles 12, verse 5. Then the prophet Shemaiah came to Rehoboam and to the leaders of Judah who had assembled in Jerusalem for fear of Shishak. Shishak is Egyptian and he has come to conquer Israel. And when he shows up, everybody from the king on down are terrified. So this prophet Shemaiah shows up and he says to them, this is what the Lord says, you have abandoned me, therefore I now abandon you to Shishak. Rehoboam has generally chosen evil. This is the pattern that Solomon set for him. He's walked in this pattern, and as a result, he's gotten himself in the country in a lot of trouble. And here comes this Egyptian commander, and he's going to decimate Israel. But look at verse 6. The leaders of Israel and the king humbled themselves and said, The Lord is just. When the Lord saw they humbled themselves, this word of the Lord came to Shemaiah. Since they have humbled themselves, I will not destroy them, but will soon give them deliverance. This is totally unexpected. Solomon never did anything like this. At no point did Solomon, now he did good things early in his life, but at no point did Solomon in all of the wickedness near the end of his life, at no point did he humble himself and repent. 
Where did Rehoboam get this from? Just because what's been handed on to you by your parents or your predecessors is evil doesn't mean you have to keep choosing those things. The good news of free will is that you don't have to make the same choice that your parents did. Solomon never did this, but Rehoboam knows this prophet has come and said we're in trouble. And so they humble themselves, they repent, and God is merciful and kind to Rehoboam. There's another thing that Rehoboam does, right? We don't have time to look at it this morning. It's in 2 Chronicles 13. But Rehoboam marries an Israelite woman. He has a lot less wives than his father did. That's a good first start. But more importantly, he marries a woman who seems to believe in Yahweh. And when you read the story of his son, Rehoboam's son, Abijah, in 2 Chronicles 13, I invite you to go home today and just read the rest of the story. There's a moment in Abijah's life that looks exactly like this moment in Rehoboam's life where he turns to the Lord and praises God and calls on God in time of trouble and God comes and blesses and honors him. And so in Rehoboam's story, it's fascinating. We see two things that he received from Solomon that caused him to head the wrong direction, but there are two things that he chose to do differently than his father that led to blessing. All of which leads us back to Ecclesiastes 2, verse 26. To the person who pleases him, God gives wisdom, knowledge, and happiness, but to the sinner he gives the task of gathering and storing up wealth to hand it over to the one who pleases him. Do you hear the clue? Be a person who pleases the Lord. If you are a person who pleases the Lord and you think about the legacy that you were handing on to your kids, that you were handing on to your successors, to those who come after you in your company, to those who come after you in your family or in your community, in your neighborhood, those that you are giving the ministry over to, this thing that you have worked for. If you are a person who works to please the Lord, you are giving yourself the best possible chance of having this transition be a blessing. And if what you have received from those who came before you, parents and predecessors, if you choose now not to follow those patterns, but to seek to please the Lord, you are giving yourself the best possible chance for the transition, as bad as it may have been, to be something God uses to be a blessing in your life. So what we're going to do this morning, because transitions are hard, because they're, they're real, and as I prayed about it this week, I felt like there are some people here this morning who are wrestling with this very thing. We're going to take some time, the next 10 minutes or so, I'm going to explain what we're going to do, for us to kind of think through this. And we're going to give you an opportunity to come forward and kneel at the steps if you would like. There's going to be some music playing. We're going to be sing. Just to come forward and engage with God, pray and deal with what he's saying here. And there's kind of two groups of people that I would like to invite to come forward during the time. First, if you're here and you're feeling a little like Solomon, you're thinking there's some stuff in your life that shouldn't be there, and you're realizing this is going to get passed on. <laughs> this is going to get passed on to the next generation. And you're thinking this may not go well, and I made all of these choices because they made a lot of sense to me in the moment, but now I'm starting to think, this is not going to go well when this gets handed on to who's next. We want to give you the chance to come forward and ask the Lord to forgive you and please have mercy. Likewise, if you feel like Solomon and you're looking at the next generation and you're seeing in them some of your own faults and sins, and you see some of these things where you made decisions in human wisdom and didn't obey the Lord, and now you're watching them make those decisions, and you're thinking to yourself, Lord, did I contribute to some of this? Are they making those choices in part because of me? We just want to invite you to come down here and receive mercy from God. 
Solomon never humbled himself, but if he had, he would have received mercy. So that's the first group. The second group is if you're here and you feel more like Rehoboam. If you're thinking, what I received from my parents, what I received from my predecessors was not healthy, it was dysfunctional. And I'm in danger of falling into the traps that were laid for me, and I desperately don't want to do that. If you want to come down front, we're making this available so that you can do what Rehoboam did and just simply humble yourself and say, Lord, have mercy. Lord, have mercy on I do not want to pass this on to those who come after me. So I'm going to pray, and then Emma's going to come back out. We're going to have a little bit of music. But during the time, if the Spirit lays on your heart, Uh, for you to be able to come down front. We want you to just be able to come down, talk to the Lord, and ask him to make you a person who pleases him so that what you hand on to the next generation or what you've received from the previous generation does not determine the blessings in life.